Let there be light. Wow. Well, I still see some cars pulling into the parking lot. My goodness. Um, but as those folks continue to make their way in, good morning. Good morning, Calvary family and any who might be visiting today. So glad that you're here. Um, it's Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, moms. Mom, happy Mother's Day. All right. Well, so glad that you're all here. Let's stand together and begin worship this morning.
may be seated. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Thank you all for being here and entering into a time of worship with all of us. Appreciate it very much. Uh, the elders have an odd way sometimes of making decisions, as you may or may not know. But um, this week at our meeting, um, it was either Rick Cummings or myself to do this announcement. And Rick offered a choice of wrestling him in the foyer for... <laughs> And my wrestling career ended in eighth grade, and his ended, I think, at college at Penn State. So <laughs> there's some wisdom in my choosing this, in more ways than one, actually. Uh, this has been a week in which God has done a little bit of work in my life. Um, Friday was the third anniversary of Linda's death, my wife. And I'm not really a, a, a memorial kind of person or an anniversary kind of person. I don't go to cemeteries, put flowers on the graves, that kind of thing. And normally what has started to uh, form is my, my daughters, I have three, usually talk to each other. And one of them will usually call me and see how I'm doing. And we share, you know, funny things, sad things, that kind of time to adjust. And one of the daughters, or actually all of them, at one point or another have said what they missed most about Linda was her mothering. And I'm not quite sure what that meant. Um, but Autumn, my middle daughter, put it this way, that when she was small, she could crawl up on Linda's lap and get a hug get some comfort. And I know Nikki was the one who would get a good back scratch. And Aubrey probably would get a joke. And if you know my daughter Aubrey, her laugh is infectious and, and healing in many ways. So this week, finally realizing that Mother's Day is now inextricably associated with uh, my wife's passing. And now I'm uh, adjusting in many ways. But the picture that has come to me from talking with my daughters is the one in which comfort is given when somebody can put their arms around you, give you words that encourages you, tells you you are loved, you are known, and you are cared for. And as I finished reading Ruth this week, a passage came out from that where Jesus in two of the Gospels talks about wanting to gather Jerusalem, his ch children. In a way, a, a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And it goes in uh, Matthew 23 and Luke 13. It's similar words. And he's talking after encountering and dealing with the scribes and the Pharisees. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chick under her wings, and you were unwilling. And so it's a bittersweet passage. Jesus is lamenting the people of Jerusalem, his people, for their unwillingness to come to him for salvation, but also for the comfort, for the protection, for the security and the love that a, a hen's wings covers her chicks. And so if you go away today with an image in your head of who God is, who Jesus is, he is one who will bring you under his wings, 
like a mother hen, comforting, caring, loving us. Because I know Mother's Day can be hard for a lot of us, whether our mom was caring and compassionate, would scratch your back, rub your feet, or not. And no matter if you had a mother like that or not, what you can be assured of is that Jesus is one who will come to us, put his arms around us, comfort us, tell us he loves us. You are secure in his salvation, and we thank him for that. So let us pray. Father, it is a beautiful day. We thank you for where we live. We thank you for our life in you. You are gracious. You are merciful. You are for us and not against us. You love us. And you love us like a mother's hen to her chicks, as well as in other pictures. Thank you for that picture that we can take with us wherever we go. Give us your truth today, how you are, who you are, through the book of Ruth. Bless Duane as he comes and gives us the word. Again, thank you for this day in Jesus' name. Amen. One thing that we have been amiss in the past, when Carol Johnson was here, Dwayne's wife, we failed to introduce her to you, and I know she's here today. She's been on our prayer list for a while. So Carol, would you please stand up and let us see you and welcome you. Thank you. Sometimes we do remember our manners. Uh, a number of uh, announcements. We do have an overflow room in the high school room. If, you're here, if you are here with your children and they are a little antsy and you don't want to really fuss with them, oh, there it is. You should pay attention to the announcements, huh? We also have what used to be called the cry room, and you can access it through this door. It doesn't have video, just audio. Um, and I'm not sure if the crying is going on if we hear it anyway. But uh, we do have good video and audio in the high school room. So if you uh, want to take advantage of that, please do so. Um, there is no Awana today. Am I right, Tim? Yes, okay. Good, thank you. Um, those of you who helped move and unload the... Um, property of Nate and Natalie and their children. Thank you so much. I don't know who you are, but I peeked into the garage window and it's full of stuff. So I take it that it happened and we appreciate all you who came out to help um, do that for us as well as for them. Also, after this service, we are still taking pictures in the uh, fellowship hall to complete I like that. Um, talk and the announcement comes up right on. <laughs> Is it going on another week? Do we have two more weeks? This week and next. This week and next. OK. So please try and uh, get there. Um, and this is really for the digital uh, directory f for Nate primarily. But it comes handy for all of us to use uh, as well. Um, in your bulletin, there's an outreach opportunity. It looks like we are restarting uh, our outreach to the Bridge House. Is that right, Bill? Yes. Yes, good. There's a note in there, and uh, that'll give you s some information to start with, and you can talk to Bill Thompson, who's in the back uh, ushering today. Also, as you leave this, uh, this morning after service, there will be flowers in the foyer. Again, this is in the bulletin. They are for uh, the women of all ages. You're free to pick a color. Uh, I'm not sure what, how many are different colors are there. But also take one to give to another significant female in your life. 
whether it's your mother, neighbor, friend, or uh, even somebody you may know who's shut in. But those flowers are for you to take and to share. I think that's it. Did I miss anything important? No? Okay. Again, thank you very much. Welcome. Let us continue our worshiping. Go ahead and stand and say hi to people without leaving your pews. Let's continue to worship.
There's nothing worth more. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare your love anymore. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your
thank you uh, that, that we know that as we're gathered here together, you are with us. I pray that our, our hearts are open to, to feel your presence, Lord, and to feel and hear your voice uh, through Dwayne this morning as he brings your message in, in Ruth. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I want to thank you for uh, the love and support that you've shown Carol and myself in these uh, past days, taking us into your hearts, and that means so much. We appreciate it, just as you've made your way into our hearts as well, and uh, we thank you. Today, I want to read to you the first chapter of the book of Ruth. The reason is... The sermon doesn't make much sense unless you know the story of what's happened. And from now on, I'm not going to read the whole text. You have to read it at home, okay? I don't hear an okay. Okay, so that you know what's going on. But we want to spend time. I'm glad you got good light here because they've made the print smaller in the modern Bibles. And... Without good light, it's hard to see. Ruth chapter 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. A man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while. Notice it says they went to live for a while. Apparently, it wasn't their intent to move there permanently, but they're going to move there for a little bit of time uh, in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malan and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpha and the other Ruth, and they had lived there about ten years. Both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, and this is the people in Israel at this time, the land that she left, God provided food for them, Naomi and her two daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. And said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? I'm going, am I going to have any more sons who would become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and he gave, we gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. At this they wept again. Then Orpha kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back to her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. But where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, Could this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she said to them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. 
I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite as her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Lord, speak to us from this story of several women and a family, really, that happened so long ago that shows the hand of God working in all things, just as you work in our lives today, in all things. Lord, may your hand be upon us today, that hand of good providence as your spirit ministers to us as we have pled in song for that spirit to do. So now, again, we ask you to minister to our heart's need and make us love you even more than we have before. In Christ's name, amen. In Charles Dickens' very famous The Tale of Two Cities, it starts off with a line that is often quoted, and many of you probably know it. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. But as we look at the book of Ruth and see what's happening with Ruth and the rest of her family, we would say, no, it's not the best of times. It's simply the worst of times, over and over and over. It was the worst of times. This is a story that reminds us of the hand of God, which is working in all things, even when we can't discern it. It's a story that for people that feel like God's hand has been harsh or hard upon them. It's a story for people who have distress piled upon distress to the point that maybe your faith begins to waver at times. It's for people who wonder why God would allow such apostate behavior by a country that seems to have so little regard for him. It's for people who feel that they've made poor decisions in their lives and surely they can't be used for anything that's significant in the Lord's work. It's for fathers and husbands that are fighting to provide for their families when everything around them seems to be harsh and hard and drying up. It's for women who are thinking that following God means that they will never be able to live a significant and meaningful life of their own. It's for people that think that leaving family and friends to follow the Lord is just too much to ask. It's for people in economic distress with little hope of immediate relief. It's for people who think they are insignificant and they could never be used in significant ways in the work of God's kingdom. It's a refreshing book. It's an encouraging book. And it shows God's leading in the life of a family living in the worst of days that you could possibly imagine. It's written for many of us who find ourselves in maybe similar situations and, and really we're in the need for a, a drink of cool, smoothing faith that helps us through the rough times. That's why I want to take the next four Sundays to rejoice in a message of hope. And the message of Ruth, as we make our way through it and put it all together, it is constantly hope that comes rising out of despair. And it shows us that hope can be ours constantly. The one thread that sews this whole book together is this. It's the providence of God. Providence means that our world and our lives are not ruled by chance or by fate, but by the hand of a glorious, almighty, benevolent God. He rules in absolutely everything. And in this book, we're taught many things about the providence of God. And this morning, we want to examine just four aspects of God's providence. And it doesn't cover it at all because God's providence is such a, a broad and an enormous statement. But we're going to point out just some highlights that we find in the book of Ruth. And the first one is that God's providence rules all things. He rules the nation. 
He brought famine on the land of Israel. He rules the family. He takes Naomi and goes with her and her family as they go into a foreign country. And he also rules the individuals, Ruth by herself. He rules all things, all things large, all things small, all things anywhere, all things always. The setting of the book of Ruth goes back to the book of Judges. It immediately precedes Ruth in God's word. And I want you to look at the description of the times that they lived in, which is found in the last verse of the book of Judges, chapter 21, verse 25. It says, in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Some translations say that everyone did what was good in their own eyes. They just did what they wanted to do. And the days of the judges were marked by a cyclical event that kept reoccurring over and over and over again. There's the rebellion of the people. There was the judgment of God. There was repentance uh, as God drew them back to himself. And there was deliverance as God provided a deliverer time after time after time. And it just repeated itself. And if you read the book of Judges, you're going to think that, that it's like a, an old record that got stuck, you know, and just kept repeating itself over and over and over again because that's exactly what happens in the book of Judges. It chases the, traces the rebellion of God's people and the provision that God makes for them by delivering them from the consequences of their own folly and their own sin in order that God might fulfill his purposes for that great nation whom he had chosen from all of the nations of the world. Judges is a story of God's providence in the life of a nation. Judges reminds us that God rules over not only the nation of Israel, but all the nations in the world. His providence ex extends to all of them. And Ruth continues the same theme, but not in the sense of a nation, but a much more personal application of the providence of God by placing it into a family rather than a national context. So while Judges spreads God's providence wide upon a whole nation, Ruth kind of narrows it down a little bit and says, look at what he does to this family. Look at how God's hand is upon this family as he takes them through some really difficult circumstances. Yes, Ruth tells us that God not only rules the nations of the world, but he rules the families in those nations, and he rules over the individuals in those families. God's providence rules all things. It reminds us that while God is ruling in the council chambers of the United Nations to complete his plan for this world, even though sometimes we can't see it, but he does. He rules there, and he rules in the council of the families of this world too, to bring about his own plan to show his love and tenderness and compassion to a lost world. And the first lesson about God's providence that I would have to acknowledge is that it rules in all of the affairs of all mankind all the time. Can you remember those all? That's God's providence. Everything always. God is in control. The second thing I want us to see about God's providence, which is really shown vividly in the book of Ruth, is that God's providence sometimes seems very harsh. And you've probably experienced that. You wonder, God, why did this have to happen to me? Now, I hope you've thought about what that means when you say that, okay? It kind of says, God, why did it have to happen to me? I'm too good for this to happen. It could happen to them, but why did it have to happen to me? Huh? Well, we're going to jump ahead in our text to verse 20 and ahead in time because now Naomi has returned to Bethlehem. And in verses 20 and 21, Naomi makes three statements about God's harsh providence in her life. First of all, in verse 20, she says, don't call me Naomi, because that means pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter, because the Almighty has made my life bitter. 
So even the names of the people she was saying, I went away pleasant, but I'm come back, and I, my life is bitter, so change my name to bitter. First notice, though, is that Naomi is not saying that she is bitter against God. That has not happened. What she says is that what God has done in her life has been very difficult. It's been very hard. It's been bitter. She's saying, my life is bitter, but she's not saying, I'm bitter. There's a big, big difference. The Christian may be called to live a bitter life, a difficult life, without developing a bitter heart or a bitter soul. This can be true for you. God may ask you to go through some very difficult circumstances in this life, but those experiences do not have to produce a bitter spirit or a bitter attitude toward God. In fact, a gracious spirit in hard circumstances is a great, great testimony to your love for the Lord. Secondly, in verse 21, she says, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. That's hard. To know what she means by full, we have to go back to the first two verses of this chapter. And it's, it reads this way. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and his two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion, and they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab, and they lived there. Do you see how her life was full when she left? Because of the famine... They were probably rather poor. I'm sure they didn't have much excess. There wasn't much excess in the whole land. They were lucky if they had food to eat to stay alive. But they did have a full family to be thankful for. And I'm sure that so many of you realize that today when it's day with family seem to get together and, and you have your family. And even if you aren't rich and even if you don't have a lot of the luxuries of life, to have that family there, doesn't that mean a full life? Oh, it does. And that's what she had. And I think there's a lesson here, especially for fathers. Things were bad in Canaan. The economic pressures were great. The land was drying up, and there wasn't much food for their families. But Elimelech, whose name means, my God is king. How about that for a name? My God is king. That's what it said. He didn't look for God to provide in Israel, but he went off to find provision in another country. In other words, I'm saying he didn't, he didn't stick in Israel to let God deliver them there. He decided that he was going to take matters into his own hands, even though his name was my God is king. He's going to take matters into his old hands, and he was going to solve the problems there. He had the physical needs of his family in mind rather than their spiritual needs, so he was off to a pagan country with all of its ungodly influence. He left the land of God's blessing. Israel was the land of God's blessing, even though they were in the midst of a famine and even though they were rebellious at this particular time. But he left the land of promise and he turned away from the promises of God that had been made to Israel. And he went to another land. And men, the lesson I think that we see here is this. We must not let economic pressures push us into decisions that might bring spiritual harm to our families. Man, if you're offered a, a promotion to go somewhere where you fear that your spiritual life and the life of your family would be adversely affected, don't go. Turn down the promotion. If your family is spiritually alive and well and thriving, stay in that circumstance, even though the pressures are to get out. Well, Elimelech, he gave way to pressures. Even in the midst of a famine, Naomi considered herself full. But when she returned from the foreign land, the pagan land, she returned empty. 
third thing that I want us to see here is that, or, that Naomi ends up in verse 21 and saying, the Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Naomi had tasted a full measure of the bitter providence of God. She knew what it was to face misfortune upon misfortune upon misfortune. She knew what had happened. Her husband had died. Her two sons had died. And though she had two daughter-in-laws, she was in effect a stranger in a foreign land, an Israelite in Moab. They were not welcome. They were not friendly to each other. She was there kind of all alone. And when she openly acknowledges that God had brought these things upon her, she doesn't blame the devil. She doesn't blame the children. She doesn't blame her husband. She doesn't blame anyone else. She recognized this too was the hand of God because God sometimes brings harsh circumstances into our life. It's not always pleasant. And she acknowledges that. But in this, we will see that the Lord refused to let her go. He refused to let her go her own way. Now he's brought her back, back to the land of promise. So we learn also that God's providence is sometimes very harsh, and it's hard to see his hand in the circumstances. And, and we cry out, why, God? Why? third lesson about God's providence that I <clears throat> want to point out is this. God's providence is a blessing for his people. Our passage doesn't say that expressly, but other passages do, including Romans 8, 28, which is one of the great themes of the whole New Testament. And we know that in all thing, God, things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. In all things, the death of your sons, the death of your husband, in all things, God works for the good. And I like to put the word spiritual in there because I think that's what's intended in this verse. In all things, God works for the spiritual good of those who love him and are called. Because everything that God puts into the life of his children is ultimately good. It all comes from the hand of a good God, and it is good. Even though we can't see it at the moment, yet it is good. And our text illustrates this truth. Naomi's lost a husband. She's lost two sons. It appears that there will not be anyone to carry on the family name. It was like a dead end. But even she could not know that God had been working in the worst of times for the nation and in personal tragedy after personal tragedy to prepare the way for the greatest king that Israel would ever see. Look at the last verse in Ruth, chapter 4, verse 22. And it says this, For Boaz was the father of Obed, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of who? David. David. Ruth appears in another genealogy, not just this one. It's found in Matthew chapter 1. It's really wrong, long, so we're not going to read it. But this genealogy is the family tree of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ruth, through all this tragedy, was one in the lineage, lineage of our Lord and our Savior, the one who brought us salvation. This is the final explanation of why God that both Naomi and Ruth probably uttered. It's the solving of the mystery of God's providence in Naomi's life. Why did Naomi go through all of this? And the end result is the birth in Bethlehem of our Lord and our Savior. See that? God provides a blessing for his people. We don't see it. We don't know how sometimes, but 
Centuries before the incarnation, God was calling his purposes, the suffering of Naomi, to provide untold blessings for mankind, first through King David, the greatest king that Israel ever had, but more importantly, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. John Flavel was a pastor in the 17th century England. He was a Puritan preacher. And he made a statement that's often read today or spoken today, and it's this. The providence of God is like a Hebrew word. Do you know how Hebrew is written? I'm sure all of you have studied it, right? All right. It's written from right to left. (laughs) It's really difficult to learn that language because it's so different. We go from left to right, right? But their words, the first letter of their word, the second letter, third letter, fourth letter, it goes from right to left. It's all backwards. And John Flavel said this, the providence of God is like a Hebrew word. It can only be read backwards. (laughs) Hmm? We look at what happened in Naomi's life and Ruth's life. And we said, how harsh God's providence was. And then centuries later, we look back. Right now, we look back to then and we say, God's providence was good. Look at where it ended. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. But in the midst of fire, it takes great faith to be firmly convinced that This, too, is in God's plan. This, too. The fourth lesson about God's providence is that that God's providence touches others through our lives. In particular, in our story here, we have a young woman who lived in Moab, a pagan country that did not worship God And she comes to fear and trust God as a result of the people that he puts in her life. She becomes a God-fearer. Listen to her words as Naomi tries to convince Ruth to stay in Moab instead of following along to Bethlehem. Her sister already went back, or her sister-in-law went back. But Ruth wants to stay with Naomi, and here's what she says in verses 16 through 18. Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her, meaning stopped urging her to stay behind. Let's get past the sentimental quoting of these verses in weddings. They're appropriate for weddings, taken completely out of context, but they're appropriate words for weddings. But let's see what they really say because they're absolutely astonishing. Here's what it means. It means that Ruth would leave her own family and her own land and go to a strange land that she had never been to before. That's amazing what she did. Secondly, because of the cultural constraints, that is that that Moabites and the Israelites were not friendly people and you didn't intermarry. Because of that, it meant that she was likely giving up any hope of marriage or having a family of her own, but that her life would be tied up in caring for Naomi until Naomi died. She would stay there with her. And that was to be her fate. As far as she could see, that was to be her fate. She also would live in a new land with strange people and customs and a new language. Think of all of that. Think of how hard that would be. But she went. And in verse 17, she makes a commitment to never return home 
Even if Naomi dies, she says, if you die, we'll bury you there. And you know what? I'll be buried in the same place. What a commitment. And lastly, and most of all, she promises, your God will be my God. All right. She's giving up the pagan gods, the pagan practices, all those things that would lead ultimately only to her death. And she said, I want to fear and worship your God. Put this in its setting. Verse 13, Ruth, Naomi has just told Ruth, and I quote here, verse 13, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. What kind of a recommendation to trust and follow God is that? <laughs> Naomi just said, God's been bitter to me. He's been harsh with me. And Ruth says, your God will be my God, okay? I trust your God. I want to love your God. Naomi has had great bitterness in, his, in her life, and it's come from God. And in spite of that, Ruth forsakes her religious heritage for the God of Israel. This is faith that sees beyond the present bitterness of life and sees in a greater way than that. It sees down into the future. Faith that sets us free from the comforts and securities of our world. Faith that says, where he leads me, I will follow. Faith that leads us to willingly follow the leading of God into the unknown, in fact, into the scary. So in order to bring Ruth into God's kingdom, God worked through Naomi. See how God's providence uses people puts people into our lives to bring us to new and greater depths of spiritual maturity and perhaps even to faith in Christ itself. God's providence works in all these things. Even Naomi's bitter experiences led to Ruth's salvation. And later on in, those, in this book, those experiences affect a godly single man in Israel who apparently didn't have any family at all. He's led to a foreigner, a most unlikely candidate for a wife. And together, they're used to prepare the way for a great king who led to Israel's prosperity and beyond that, eventually to the birth of the Lord. Lord of lords and king of kings. Wow. God's providence is woven through all of this. It's hope. It's when you think that there's nowhere else to go and nothing to do and despair sets in, there's hope. Always hope for the child of God. Let me close with one last application. When we've decided that God is against us, we usually exaggerate our hopelessness. <laughs> it's it's kind of human nature. We can become so bitter we can't see the rays of light peeping out from amongst the, around the clouds. It was God who broke the famine and opened up the way for Naomi and Ruth to go back to Bethlehem. It was God who preserved a kingsman, Boaz, to continue Naomi's line. It was God who constrains Ruth to stay with Naomi when everything was said she should have gone back home. It was God. And in the midst of her bitterness, it's difficult for Naomi to see God's mercy at work in her life. Yet when you believe in the sovereign working of God, and you believe that he loves you, and you believe that he works for the good of those who do love him, it gives a freedom and a joy that can't be shaken by hard times. It makes men who refuse to leave a place of spiritual blessing to pursue material prosperity. It makes women who are unafraid to follow God into the ventures that seem to offer no hope for the satisfying of our natural desires. Ruth was written to people just like us to give us a hope that cannot fail and that cannot be extinguished and will never be exhausted. To give us a hope. You see how God's providence... He worked all this for Ruth so that today you could be reminded of his sovereign hand in your life and always bringing hope. 
His providence is the pathway, not necessarily to pleasure and comfort here on this earth, but God's providence is the pathway to eternal glory. Our Father, we're, our eyes are so blind we can't see so many times you're working in our lives. And so our hearts are faint and we have trouble trusting sometimes, but, but your hand is always there. The Spirit of God is always with us, not just here in corporate times of worship, but wherever we go. And you rule in all of the people, all of the time, and all of the circumstances of life. And I am personally thankful, so thankful, that my life is not ruled by chance nor by fate, but it is ruled by the hand of an almighty, sovereign, benevolent God. And we bow before you. And we humble ourselves before your wisdom. Not understanding it, but thankful for it. In Christ's name, amen. Let's sing this together.
Thank you, Daniel. Great song, Providence of God. And we're thankful that you are our guide because only you could keep us and lead us on the right path to eternal glory. And may you tread that path with joy and thanksgiving today, understanding that, that always hope, always hope in Christ our Lord. Amen. I want to remind you that at the close of our service, our elders are always up here at the front, and maybe it's a hard time that you want them to pray with you about. Maybe it's a good time that you want to rejoice with them concerning it, something in your life. You come and let them pray with you as others leave. Thank you. <laughs>